Thank you very, very much for joining me on this beautiful day in this beautiful place. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to visit. I haven't been here before. Um, I should also say that I'm not a historian. Um, I hope that doesn't mean I'm going to be thrown off the ledge afterwards. Um, <laughs> I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I oversee our collection of historic and contemporary Native American artwork at the New York State Museum. And I do a lot of work um, reaching out to the different indigenous nations and communities across what is now New York and really bringing the past into the present and doing research in that regard. Um, so my story today does touch on history and certainly Native American and American history, um, but it's also rooted in the present. And um, as I continue to do research on this topic um, and this object itself, um, new things come to light. So today I wanted to sort of frame my talk to you in terms of relationships and the relationships between nations, between friends, um, between museums and communities, and I will certainly talk a little bit about the circulation of this pipe tomahawk in a collector market too. Um, so before I get started, I use the term Haudenosaunee, uh, which is um, the name that means people of the long house or they extend the rafters. Um, you may be familiar with the term Iroquois, um, same group of people. And I'll also be talking about uh, Seneca or the people of the Great Hill, um, Anondawaga in the Seneca language. And right now is when I'm going to cue. Oh, there it is. It works. All right. Sorry. I was pressing the wrong button. Um, so the area that I'm going to be talking about today is the Tonawanda Seneca Nation, so out in western New York. Um, but this gives you a sense of the different uh, indigenous nations here in New York. This is Haudenosaunee specifically. Um, so keep that map in mind. Um, it seems very appropriate to be here at Grant Cottage today because Grant did indeed have a friendship with Ely Parker, who is um, from the Tonawanda Seneca Nation, and I will talk about that as well. Um, I wanted to begin, though, with the arrival of this pipe tomahawk. Um, there are periodically things stolen from museums, and very rarely are they ever returned. And so um, I had read through, I've been at the New York State Museum for three years, and I had read through museum records. I had come across some extensive research done by George Hamill, a previous staff employee at the New York State Museum. And I had read about this missing piece from the collection. Um, so it was a great surprise that on a quiet Friday afternoon in mid-April 2018, I received a letter from a law firm on the northwest coast stating that an anonymous connection may or may not know the whereabouts of a Seneca artifact, a corn planter tomahawk, that may have belonged to the museum. And the letter asked if I wanted to receive this item, if it were to be located. And if so, I should respond with my level of interest. So in other words, this was very clearly lawyer speak for, we totally have your stolen object, <laughs> and we're scared that you're going to sue us. So just letting you know. Um, and so I did get in touch with the law firm. Um, I did eventually get in touch with the collector, and some photographs were exchanged. This was actually one of the first photographs um, sent from the collector. Um, this is the pipe tomahawk in her house. And as someone who spent 12 years in the Southwest, I'd just like to point out this is a beautiful Two Gray Hills Navajo weaving. So it was in very good company. Um, the actual construction of the pipe tomahawk, it's a haft that is made of curly maple. Um, so it produces these beautiful rings on the handle of the wood. Um, that same kind of curly maple is used on the back of fiddles and cellos and violas, if you picture the back of that kind of instrument. And it's inlaid with a silver or silver alloy um, with some really beautiful designs. Um, the handle and the silver inlay are probably um, dating to mid-1800s or a little earlier. 
um, the actual, oh, sorry, <laughs> the actual um, blade itself is what we think dates to 1792. Um, and that is the original blade um, that was given as a gift from George Washington to a corn planter, supposedly in Philadelphia. Um, we know this because of Ely Parker, who gave this object to the New York State Museum in 1850 and wrote about how he came to acquire it um, June 29, 1850 in a letter to the Board of Regents. Um, so, 70 years ago, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ely Parker um, before I get into the theft of this piece. Um, but Ely Parker, this is him older, um, in 1844, he was about 16 years old, and he entered into a bookstore in Albany where he happened to meet a gentleman named Lewis Henry Morgan very famous American anthropologist who was um, very interested in Seneca people and history and Haudenosaunee um, people in general as well. And he would go on to really be um, an instrumental character in the building of um, American anthropology. He was about 26 at the time when he met Ely Parker. Um, also, it's important to note that at this time period, 1844, um, the Tonawanda um, Band of Seneca are really in a situation where they have continued to try and get their lands back. Um, through a series of treaties, the Buffalo Creek Treaties, they are dispossessed of their land and then they're finally given the opportunity to buy back their land from the Ogden Land Company. Um, and so this is happening during this time period and I think that's important because Ely Parker, this young man, is um, being depended on by a great number of people in his community to attend um, a group of Seneca going to Albany to um, basically ask for help in getting their land back. And it's also important to mention here that Haudenosaunee are matrilineal and that women have great respect and um, roles in the um, community and in their nations for making important decisions, and too often in histories that's been neglected or left out. So even though I'm talking today about Corn Planter and Ely Parker, please be aware that behind these great men are great women who are instrumental in the decision making going on, and women in fact who have been watching Ely Parker since he was a little child and determining his um, characteristics as a leader and promoting him to be a leader in the community. So they meet in this bookstore, um, Ely Parker and Lewis Henry Morgan, and a lifelong friendship begins. Um, Morgan at the time, um, a little later, 1847, is collecting artifacts for the New York State Museum, or for, at the time, the New York State Board of Regents, um, who have requested, put out a call for people to donate what they're calling Indian relics or artifacts to the museum to create a collection. And Morgan felt very strongly that material culture is one avenue to understand people and to understand history and culture. Um, so he really took up the um, challenge and began collecting material um, objects. And much of that was done through his friendship with Ely Parker, who took him to visit his family, um, who helped introduce him to people, who made objects for the collection specifically. Ely Parker's sister, Caroline Parker, um, made an entire garment that is in our collection, which is, um, and actually it's currently on tour, part of an um, exhibit called Hearts of Our People at Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, so anyways, there's a great friendship that emerges from these two, and it has an impact on the New York State Museum collection, too. Tomahawks, so the name, this is a nicer picture of it. Here it is, once it returned. Um, the word tomahawk is actually an Algonquin word, um, but tomahawks, much like this, pipe tomahawks, emerge in the 1700s. And they're really an ingenious invention because you have something very utilitarian um, connected with a pipe to actually smoke. 
and smoking was done often um, to make agreements and to establish uh, negotiations between, pe between parties. Um, it was something that was very much part of Native American cultures across what we now consider the United States. Um, and so this beautiful piece oops, um, has hallmarks of a pipe tomahawk from the 1700s. So it has the way that the blade is formed, the way that the pipe bowl is formed, um, distinguish it as an earlier model, so to speak, of pipe tomahawks. Uh, Ely Parker, so the story of this is that Ely Parker obtains it um, in the early, mid-1830s, roughly, um, 1838 or so, and he has a new haft put on the pipe tomahawk, and he also has a brass plate with his name engraved on it, put on the top. So that's part of it um, today, and sometimes we call it the Ely Parker pipe tomahawk because of that. Another close-up of the inlay. All right. So this is a 1796 portrait by the artist Frederick Bartoli of Corn Planter. And you can see he has a pipe tomahawk in his hand that he's smoking. Um, this, I don't know where this one is. This one is not in any museum collection that we know of. Um, Corn Planter was the son of a trader, um, a Dutch man named John Abiel. And he was the great-grandson of another Johannes Abiel, who actually served as mayor for Albany twice. Um, he was the second and the 13th mayor of Albany before he passed away in 1711. Um, <coughs> Corn Planter's father, um, being a trader who went out to Seneca Territory to do business, um, had Corn Planter with a Seneca woman. Um, and her name was She Who Goes to the River. Um, not much of their relationship we know about, um, except that it was a very strained father-son relationship, and he really grew up uh, in the Seneca community and part of the Seneca Nation, um, because being, of course, a matrilineal society, you are a member of the community that your mother is part of. So. Uh, Corn Planter's mother was a Seneca woman of the Wolf Clan, and Corn Planter would have been considered as such, too. By the 1790s, Haudenosaunee are, um, they have emerged from the American Revolution. There has been dispute, um, there's been fighting, and um, there have been about seven meetings between 1790 and 1794 um, with the early um, American colonists and leaders, and included in that would have been leaders such as Fish Carrier and Farmer's Brother and Red Jacket, all very famous Haudenosaunee leaders. Um, women were also present at many of these treaty negotiations, um, and that's something that only recently historians have begun to recognize. Um, George Washington, whom Corn Planter would have met, and um, in fact they have copious correspondence um, in the Department of War Papers. You can read some of the letters back and forth. Washington is trying to establish a peaceful relationship with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy after all the fighting that has gone on, in part because they're still having trouble having peaceful relationships with tribes that are further west um, in the Great Lakes area. So Unfortunately, Washington has left a pretty dismal reputation for the Haudenosaunee, and it's in a very famous letter that Corn Planter reminds George Washington of this and says, when your army entered the country of the Six Nations, we called you town destroyer. And to this day, when that name is heard, our women look behind them and turn pale, and our children cling close to the necks of their mothers. Our counselors and warriors are men and cannot be afraid but their hearts are grieved for the fears of our women and children and desire that it may be buried so deep as to be heard no more. So I think one of the reasons that this pipe tomahawk is interesting from a historical and from certainly an anthropological perspective is that treaty making was very difficult. It required a lot of time and a lot of effort. The Treaty of Canandaigua, which is in 1794 um, out in western New York, took place over uh, months, and in cold months, too, in the fall, when it's 
starting to get really chilly. Um, and oftentimes, gifts were presented between parties. So Washington would have given um, pipe tomahawks to and medals to various leaders of the Haudenosaunee to help aid in the process of these intense negotiations. Um, this is Red Jacket. And he's wearing a um, peace medal here, which has uh, an engraving of Washington and Red Jacket on it. And of course, he has also a pipe tomahawk. That's a close-up of the peace medal. Again, with a pipe tomahawk. The pipe tomahawk is also interesting because not only is it featuring in terms of treaty negotiations and gifts to establish peaceful relations, um, but it also comes to really symbolize for a lot of American settlers, Native Americans, and even Native American aggression. Um, this is early 1710 for Ralst paintings, and the reason I show them is because you can already see that there are um, tomahawks appearing in the paintings, the portraits done of these um, Haudenosaunee kings. This is the Mohawk king um, on the right here. And again, another picture, this is a portrait of a uh, red jacket, and you can see again he has the pipe tomahawk in his hand. Um, these are, of course, are more peaceful sort of portraitures. Um, this, in particular, piece um, is from Vandalin in 1804, and is a um, mythologized account of Jane McCree being um, kidnapped and scalped. So the pipe tomahawk certainly has this um, violent element to it as well. Um, it, I think, contributes to the metaphor, bury the hatchet, um, to make peace, or raise the hatchet, to start war. Um, but it comes to symbolize as well for American settlers this uh, feeling of violence and Native American violence. And Scott Manning Stevens, Mohawk scholar, talks extensively about how that symbol um, becomes ingrained in American settlers. Um, on to theft. So if you're wondering <laughs> why it's so miraculous that this pipe tomahawk came back, in part that's because it was gone from the museum for 70 years. This is what the New York State Museum looked like in the New York State Education Building. Um, these glass vitrines that were locked but were not very secure, obviously, um, because at some point between eight, uh, 1947 and 1950, one of the locks was broken on this case, and the pipe tomahawk was stolen. Um, it left. There was no immediate record of its theft. Um, the closest, the reason that we are able to eliminate it to this three-year period is because of researchers. Uh, Harold Peterson and the Woodwards who came to the New York State Museum to take pictures of tomahawks to write a book about them and lo and behold one was missing. Um, this also occurred at a time period when the museum was moving and there was also a new director and the thought at the time was this pipe tomahawk is missing from our inventory there's a note about a case having to have a lock replaced maybe it was in that case Maybe it will turn up later. We'll just keep doing an inventory of the collection. It didn't turn up. Um, the next clue that we have is <coughs> this auction uh, in 1980. This auction um, was included the collection of an archaeologist named Ogilvy Davis who was apparently known for being very unscrupulous and for saying things like, there's no museum I can't steal something from. Um, <laughs> so I don't know why people weren't alert when he came into a museum. <laughs> um, but at any rate, his collection was put on auction uh, in 1980 here at the Bob Chuck and Rich Roan Auction Gallery. And interestingly enough, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, I'm sorry. Um, they modified the picture of it. So our pipe tomahawk, I 
think I have better pictures of this. On one side is engraved the name of Corn Planter in Seneca, and on the other side is the name John Andrus, which we think is the name of the uh, person who made the blade. So in the picture from the 1980 auction, you'll notice that in, uh, the engraving has been taken off, and so the picture has been doctored, um, supposedly to make it less identifiable. So it was sold at this auction um, into the hands of a man named Bill Grimison, um, who promptly sold it afterwards to a man named Jim Hart of New Hope, Pennsylvania. And the reason I know these names is because when this pipe tomahawk was returned to us, the collector also gave a giant notebook full of papers and pictures of the pipe tomahawk. It was sort of like the collector's album that went along with it. And each time someone bought it, they added, you know, oh, an article about Ely Parker, or oh, a picture of a uh, corn planter from the Bartoli painting. And so it became this scrapbook that accompanied the pipe tomahawk. Um, as best I can tell, there were at least seven private owners um, of the pipe tomahawk from roughly 1950, that era, to uh, 2018 when it returned to the State Museum. But I think it was probably more like 10 people that actually owned it at one time or another. Their names are just not all in the scrapbook. Um, in 1982, a gun collector and enthusiast named William Myers wrote to the director at the time of the museum, Charles Gillette, asking for pictures and information about the pipe tomahawk. And at the time, Gillette suspected that maybe this person actually knew where it was located, um, even though he claimed not to. Uh, well, in our scrapbook is the original letter. <laughs> William Myers wrote to the director, so he did indeed know where it was. Um, have any of you been to the Fenimore Cooper Museum? Excellent. So you've perhaps seen the George Thaw collection, which is a beautiful collection of Native American art from all over the country. Thaw was a very active collector. Um, interestingly enough, he owned the pipe tomahawk for 10 days. <laughs> Um, he purchased it uh, in 1990 or thereabouts and perhaps, we don't know, discovered that it was stolen uh, from the museum and promptly returned it to the dealer that he had bought it from in New York City. Um, this man is William Sturdivant and I love this picture because sometimes that's how I feel. Um, <laughs> he was a curator at the Smithsonian. Um, and an ethnologist, and wrote a lot about uh, Haudenosaunee people in Seneca. And in the 1990s, um, George Hamill, whom I mentioned to you before, caught wind of the pipe tomahawk being in the hands of this dealer uh, in Park Avenue, New York City, um, who had sold it period or sold it briefly to George Thaw, and then it had returned to him. And Hamill asked. Sturdivant to go take a look at the pipe tomahawk in the dealer's shop to authenticate it, to make sure it was actually ours. Uh, Sturdivant went down and, oh here you can see the engraving a little bit better. According to him, the engravings were not on the blade and it left him with enough doubt as to whether or not it was actually our pipe tomahawk. Um, subsequently, after having several different uh, metalsmiths and farriers look at this pipe tomahawk and correspondence with a master um, bladesmith down at Colonial Williamsburg, I've come to the conclusion that at some point the engraving on the blade was ground down, not completely off, but a little bit, and that perhaps some kind of similar colored putty was put over the blade so that they couldn't see the names on it. Um, which hurts, because why would you do that to such a precious object? Um, but we think that's what happened, and then later the putty was removed and the engravings were restored. If you look very closely with a magnifying glass, you can actually see some scratches and marks around the engravings on the blade that indicate that that's what happened. Um, but it's still in very pristine condition. So again, the pipe tomahawk slips out of the hands of the New York State Museum because it can't be authenticated 
according to Sturtevant. Um, oh, you can kind of see here, there are some scratches where apparently someone along the way who had it uh, tried to sharpen it. So it amuses me a little bit because I think if it was in someone's living room, maybe they had a cocktail party and said, oh, let's cut the cheese with this. I don't know. Um, but there are also some engraving marks on the actual letters as well. John Andrus still remains much of a mystery, as I said, but we think he's the person who made the blade. Interestingly enough, his name does come up in an 1890 census in Connecticut, um, but I'm not sure if that's the same person. Um, metalsmiths and silversmiths would have been very valuable people um, during the late 1700s, certainly into the um, early 19th century as well. And they were really people that you wanted in your community to fix things, of course, and also to make things um, that you needed for everyday life. Um, today, the corn planter grant um, has mostly been flooded by Kinsua Dam. Um, unfortunately, because of flooding in Pittsburgh, and so the Army Corps of Engineers um, instrumented the dam, Kinsua Dam, which um, is certainly an important part of Seneca history today, too. Um, there's a memorial still to corn planter, oops, um, on the corn planter um, grant, but also the uh, Seneca Nation Museum out in Salamanca also has one of the original memorials to corn planter. Um, if you're wondering where the corn planter pipe tomahawk is today, uh, it came back to us in 2018, and it was on display at the New York State Museum in our lobby area for about six months. And currently, it is at the Seneca Iroquois National Museum in Salamanca on loan on exhibit there. Um, and so we'll see from there um, when it comes back here um, or where it may go on loan for other institutions as well. So... Um, thank you for joining me today, and I'll answer some questions because it's a very involved story, so I'm sure I left something out. Yes? Is there any indication in the history of how much it was being sold for, or how much they had to pay for? Yes, um, there is some. So it was purchased from the auction for, I believe, $6,500 um, in 2010 or thereabouts. It was purchased at auction um, for $75,000. $75,000, and the um, person who bought it at that auction <coughs> kept it until they returned it to the museum in 2018. Did the museum have to pay for that? No, we didn't. Thank goodness. Yes? Do you, can, you, can you share any more about the final step, or how long was it out in what was it, Washington State or Oregon? It was in the Northwest Coast um, in a private collector's home. They, at some point, um, the, uh, so it was a couple, and the husband passed away, and his widow uh, approached an auction house and said, you know, can I um, put this up for sale? And the auction house actually was the one that said, you know, this is a record of being stolen from the New York State Museum. Why don't you think about returning it? And so it was that conversation, actually, that started um, her thinking about how to return it. Um, so after our subsequent emailing and picture trading back and forth to ascertain that it was indeed the Pipe Tomahawk, um, she sent it to the museum. And um, I waited with breathless anticipation <laughs> in the loading dock area basement for like two hours for a very uh, inauspicious box to arrive, <laughs> and it was inside it. Yeah, it was very exciting. <laughs> Did any of the Seneca, uh, you know, tribal members? Uh, I know it's on. It was on view at their museum, but did they get involved in the? you know, rejoicing, having it back? Was oh, there a yes. kind of ceremony or something? Or? They did. So when it went out to the Seneca Nation Museum, um, they had a special event for it with speakers from their community um, talking about it, and it was filmed. Um, in fact, you could probably find it online. 
because um, they did film it. I saw part of it, and their director, Dave Shango, gave a very eloquent speech about it. Um, and they had an open um, exhibit area for the community to come and look at it and take pictures. Um, and for me, it was really beautiful to see on Facebook. I couldn't make it to that event, but it was really lovely to see people taking pictures with it and um, how meaningful it is that it's part of their community and that it's back there for, for them to see and appreciate. Um, I'm working with um, a Seneca scholar named Randy John um, on an article about this pipe tomahawk. So hopefully you will be able to read about it in the New York State Archives magazine um, in the coming months here um, as we continue to write and do research on it. <laughs> Would it have been typical for the um, tomahawk to be the blade to have been um, produced by somebody outside of the, the, the nation that the tomahawk belongs to? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the pipe tomahawk is most likely of non-native make, um, you know, until I find out more about John Andrus. But my, um, from what we can gather, it would have been non-native made. And a gift entirety? in its entirety, and then something that would have been presented to Corn Planner um, as a thank you gift for this. Um, and Red Jacket, too, you know, was given these as well. Um, what makes it interesting is that when it lost its handle, um, you know, in the 1830, well, uh, 1836, roughly thereabouts, um, and then a little bit later, Ely Parker obtains it. Um, from his, in his community, and he has a new haft or, or um, made for it. And so that may, in fact, be Seneca made, um, because um, certainly Native people, Haudenosaunee people, even Seneca people, were very skilled at silver work. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if the handle and the silver inlay on it now, mm -hmm. it was Native made. Okay. Yeah. Can you maybe speak a little bit about the significant <coughs> significance of gifts in the culture? Yeah, um, gift giving goes back um, quite a ways. It's a, a way of exchanging um, to exchanging objects that are meaningful, and also in respect of the negotiations and where you're coming from, and really establishing good relationships between parties and between people. Um, and certainly, the tomahawk was part of that. The peace medal was something else that was part of that. Um, oftentimes garments were um, sometimes gifts as well. Um, I think I failed to mention this, but um, Corn Planter later on in his years as he got older had a vision, a dream, um, that he needed to get rid of his belongings and get rid of the gifts that he had been given. Um, and so he had many of them destroyed. Um, the pipe tomahawk was kept because he gave that to a man in his community named Smallberry, whom he had designated to be his successor for the corn planter title um, as a leadership role in that community. Um, Smallberry hung on to the pipe tomahawk, and then when he passed, his widow kept it. Um, and at some point during this time period, it lost the handle, so it was just the blade. Um, Smallberry's widow then sells it to Ely Parker, and based on her description of what the original handle looked like, Ely Parker had the handle made in that likeness. Um, and then, of course, uh, it entered into the New York State Museum collections through Morgan. Um, but gift giving is instrumental um, in terms of negotiations and building relationships with Native people, and it's something that goes on today. Um, Certainly, when I go out to do field work, I'm very careful um, and respectful to have appropriate gifts for people who are sharing their knowledge and their time with me. Um, and this was something that was really done between leaders and between communities um, to really forge those relationships. And that's one reason why I think this pipe tomahawk is so meaningful. Um, here it is again to remind us of our relationships between uh, native nations, native communities, um, and that we share land and resources. Yes? What kind of gifts would you be giving? Do I give? People? What What kind of gifts are exchanged today? Uh, oh my goodness, all sorts. Um, 
sometimes, at least in the southwest, Pendleton blankets. Um, sometimes um, out here, gifts of quill work. Um, sometimes baskets, um, beautiful black ash baskets, fancy baskets. Um, you know, sometimes it can be as simple as buying a meal or sharing a meal. Um, gosh, all sorts of gifts, really. Um, but not tomahawks. Not, not pipe tomahawks so much anymore, no. no. But, but gifts of equal value, I would say, in terms of utilitarian and aesthetic. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and thank you.